This is the DRF Players Podcast. Hello and welcome to the DRF Players Podcast. This is the June 6th, Tuesday, 2017 edition, show 244. I'm your host, Peter Thomas Fornital, back with you from the Brooklyn Bunker on this rainy Tuesday. Uh, joining me, as always, Jonathan Kinchin, not from the planet Texas today, but from what I understand, the planet Detroit. How did the people's champ end up there? Uh, I thought he ended up here, but uh, apparently we're having a little bit of a, a microphone problem because I'm not hearing him in my ears anyway. Uh, but we'll try to get that straightened out. We'll have Jonathan come in in a moment. Is that you, JK? Yeah, yeah. No, I'm here. It's uh, it's uh, <laughs> Plain of Detroit is, is struggling in the Wi-Fi department, but uh, but uh, I'm here. So it's it's uh, hopefully we can work through it. Excellent. Did you do a little, did you, you know, we, we always do those speed checks. Is that the issue? Oh boy, I can tell it's going to be a long hour already. Um, let's move on and talk a little bit about some of the stuff that happened this weekend. I had the pleasure of being down in at Monmouth Park for the Pick Your Prize contest on June 3rd. Huge success, something like 172 entries up from 140 in the previous year. I uh, got to spend some nice time with my driver, uh, Eric Bilek, on the way down. That was cool. And then was sitting during the day in the parterre boxes, the original luxury boxes uh, in all of sports, from what I understand, and a fantastic way to take in the races. Um, and we really had a, had a great time, was sitting with uh, some friends from the NTRA, was also sitting with a bunch of folks in the Matisse crew, uh, both of whom, Paul and Duke anyway, the, the uh, not, not Chick who was there also, but Paul and Duke ended up finishing in the prize pool, getting, uh, getting uh, major, major tournament seats as a result. The overall winner was also a friend of the podcast, uh, Paul Sherman got the job done. He wins not only cash, but his trip to uh, to the Breeders' Cup, which I know he was excited about. Great to see one of the good guys and somebody with one of the most impressive resumes in all of uh, handicapping contest history improve upon that at Monmouth on Saturday. Funny story from Paul Sherman, and this is a reason, another reason why it's always such a good thing to sit with uh, people who you, you, you like and, and you get and, uh, and you can count on. Paul, when he was about to make the winning bet in the tournament, um, was a little bit distracted. He was multi-tabling. We talk about multi-tabling a lot. That's where you're playing in more than one contest at once. And... Uh, it, I, I like it. it. It's a, it's a way to make the work that you've done already for one contest pay all that much more. Cause when you have a good day, you don't just win one contest. You can potentially win three or four, something that our, uh, recalcitrant, uh, guest today or co-host Jonathan Kitchen knows something about. But anyway, so Paul was multi-tabling and he got so distracted with his online contest that he nearly missed the chance to put in his final bet. And uh, his buddy, Mitch Schumann, with whom he sits at so many of these tournaments, uh, tapped him on the shoulder and said, hey, Paul, there's a minute to post. Don't you think you better get this bet in? And uh, sure enough, that's exactly what he did. He was able to get that bet in. He ends up winning the contest, hitting a nice, he was down to about $250. He liked the three in the race. That was his main opinion. And uh, ended up catching a nice long shot in second, and in the process ended up overshooting his mark. He was thinking he wanted to try to get about five thousand to win uh, the whole deal, and he ended up with eight thousand and the victory. Another funny thing, and this is we, I've talked about this idea before. I, I think I wrote about it a little bit in the winning contest player. I call it the decision tree. Um, sometimes when you're in a tournament, things that happen affect your future actions 
in ways that you don't you don't even necessarily think about. And that's what happened to Paul. It actually helped Paul at Monmouth that he was down to 250 bucks and had to play those exactas because if he had done better and had more money, say he had a thousand dollars going to the last race, given that his main opinion was on the three, he would have just bet to win. Now he still would have finished in the prize pool. He would have had an opportunity to, um, he would have had an opportunity to maybe even finish in the top five and be eligible to win two prizes, but he wouldn't have won the thing outright. That's for sure. And he wouldn't have ended up with as much money on his bankroll. So funny enough, it actually helped him going into the last race that he was, uh, that, that, that he was down to the 250 on his bankroll. So that was the main story to come out of there. And I understand we might have a, we might have a surprise guest now, Subbing for our man Jonathan Kitchen, is that right? Did the uh, I think life, I... <laughs> did the life vest work? <laughs> <laughs> Once again, I already owe you a bottle of booze for the last time you had to bail us out when uh, the People's Champ had some technology trouble. But now it seems like I might have to send a whole case. That voice you hear on the other end of the call, that's Matt Bernier. Matt, how are you doing today? I'm good. Sorry for the little delay there. I was just uh, literally hopping out of the shower in my phone. I look down and there's a text and I see, oh, Jesus, we got problems. And I was listening to I could hear Jonathan's connectivity being a little bit uh, wonky out there in Detroit. So um, I'm good. I, I, it sounds like things are hopefully going to clear up here a little bit here. Yeah. I you know what? It's okay. I will sacrifice the next few days if we can get good weather for the Belmont Stakes Festival, which, of course, kicks off on Thursday. Some good racing Thursday and Friday. And then, of course, the big day on Saturday. I have not yet um, had the guts to take a look at the weather and see what it's supposed to be. Have you Have you done that or should I take a look right now? Yeah, so far, I think Friday is supposed to have just kind of a, a little chance of a thunderstorm. But I got to be honest, at this point in the year, I'm okay yeah. with that. And then Saturday, I think, is supposed to be, right now, clear sailing. I think like 10%, 20% chance, but, you know, I don't really look at that as anything too, too concerning in low, mid-80s. So um, might be the best of the three days as far as Triple Crown is concerned. Well, we'll take that. Um, at, we'll, we'll, we'll absolutely take that, and we can sacrifice the next couple of days. Um, I was almost expecting to see you at the Monmouth contest this past weekend, Matt. Had, did you? Uh, was it under consideration at all for you to go down there now that uh, DRF employees are eligible for more of the potential prize pool in an event like the Monmouth contest? It 100% would have, but we already, months in advance, had a wedding planned up in Maine, so... I um, I actually shot up to Massachusetts Wednesday night. I had to work from my parents' house on Thursday, and then we went up to Maine for a for a very nice ceremony. Otherwise, I certainly would have been down there. Well, your friends have an excellent choice and place to get uh, married in Maine. Susan and I were married in Camden, Maine, on the coast. Where were you? Uh, where were you located? The the wedding the itself wedding. was in York, and actually, my girlfriend's parents they own a house in York. So whenever we can get up there for a quick minute or two, we we try to shoot up. That's awesome. It's a great uh, a great state in the union. I vividly remember many years ago when we had a horse running and we're up in Maine um, racing against the clock to get to Scarborough Downs just in time to watch <laughs> yeah. X check run a game second. Have you ever uh, have you ever spent any time at Scarborough? I've not. The last time I I, I usually uh, when I was growing up, my family would go up to Maine every year in the summer for like our family vacations. But I haven't been back there prior to you know her family getting the house probably in 10 years or so so it had been a while and that was well before i was involved in horse racing so um no i, I can't say I've, I've ever ventured to any of the fine establishments up there particularly the racetrack but um scarborough downs i'm, I'm well aware of where it is <laughs> it must have been a while ago if i was not just sitting and watching on wi-fi like susan's family's <laughs> yeah. cabin either yeah. didn't have wi-fi back it was must have been something like that putting the pieces of the story together okay now i heard a rumor we may have jonathan kitchen back on the call are you here jonathan yeah well i heard that matt just got out of the shower so i was assuming that there's a chance i could have a conversation with matt when he didn't have pants on and it, <laughs> it was uh it was enough to get me to figure out what i had to do to get this uh get this technology situation sorted out so uh looks like i'm the one that's being rewarded 
things that mo things that motivate the people's champ. Uh, well, gentlemen, Matt, if you have a minute here, you know, it sounds like JK is secure. If you've got to other things to do, we understand. But if we can keep you around, at least for the conversation I want to have about our early look at the Belmont Stakes card, uh, do, do you have a minute to potentially uh, hang with us and, and give some early thoughts on the Belmont doings? Of course. Got a couple minutes. I listen to you guys every Tuesday, so why not? I'll be here. Beautiful, beautiful. All right, well, let's start by talking about uh, the horse that I'm going to take a, a not-so-wild guess here is going to be a heavy, heavy favorite for the Belmont Stakes in Classic Empire. This is a horse for me uh, what was a little bit against going into the Derby, was extremely on for the Preakness, and now I'm worried... Uh, you know, usually when you talk about that concept of the last time was the time, you're usually talking about a long shot who was a huge price the previous time and then gets bet down in the next start to the point where, you know, you don't necessarily need to bother keying all of your wagering around him. That's not really the case with Classic Empire. They they bet him like crazy in the Preakness. I just, I'm really kind of not knowing what I want to do here with him. Where do you stand, Matt, with Classic Empire at the moment uh, as we stand uh, several days out from the Belmont Stakes? Well, he makes well, he, he makes all the sense in the world. He's just kind of uninteresting, I think, from a wagering standpoint. He's going to be a heavy favorite, I would imagine. I'm thinking probably in that four to five range. And I don't know. It's one of those things. I feel like from an individual standpoint, you know, just the Belmont itself, I have no interest in him. But from a multi-race standpoint, whether it's a pick three or pick four, pick six, I think you have to at least acknowledge that he's one of the one of the likelier winners in the race, whether he offers good value or not. That's a different story. What do you think, Jonathan, from this far out? I know you have some other uh, fancies in the race, but what's your idea? Is Classic Empire a horse to beat, to potentially use defensively, as Matt suggests, in horizontal bets? Um, wh where, where are you with uh, our old pal? I mean, I think he has to be used defensively. Like Matt said, I mean, he's he's going to be four to five, and he's not like a bad four to five. He's got a, a legit chance of winning the race. But in a situation like this, I'm going to look elsewhere for a little bit more, a um, little bit more value. Uh, things go wrong in races, and uh, and, and I, I I don't usually have a, a tough time, you know, taking short price horses, you know, despite that. But I, I think in this spot, I'm going to look for something a little bit different. Although I will be using and like like Matt said, and defensively in in multi race spots. There was an interesting quote in the uh, in the article about Twisted Tom uh, being entered that Dave Grenning, I believe, wrote earlier this week on DRF.com. Lots of great Belmont Stakes coverage on the site right now. Folks should check it out. There's a couple of really good free articles. And of course, if you're DRF Plus, you're going to get all the good stuff. But in this article about Twisted Tom, Brown said that, you know, the, I... The implication was he, he did, you know, he understood that the horse on form and figures didn't necessarily fit, but that the distance could be the great equalizer, the mile and a half of the test of champions. How big a factor for you, Matt, is the distance when handicapping this race? Oh boy, that's a tough, tough question. It, you, I mean, you've got to factor it in certainly, but I, I kind of feel like it is the the great unknown where you, you, you really don't know if any of these horses are going to go on with it. I'm more interested in a horse that if you could tell me that you're going to have some tactical speed throughout and you can maybe you're not outright on the lead, but if you're going to be in the front half of the field, um, I'm just immediately going to gravitate more toward you than I would a horse coming from way out of it. Like a like a looking at Lee, who I've, I've been more on his side than most people and all in each one of these races and really all the way leading up through to the Triple Crown. But I just don't love the way this kind of race sets up for him. A true one-run closer, I don't care that he's going to be able to see out the distance. He's probably going to be so far behind that it's not going to make a difference. Do you, do you think of him, though, as somebody to uh, potentially round out verticals once again? I mean, are you still interested in him on that level? Yeah, probably. I, I could see using him underneath in a try or a super, but he's just, you know, if, again, if I'm going back to the same playing the pick six, he's not one that I'm going to have on my tickets. Just I know that right now before the PPs come out, before the draw happens tomorrow afternoon. I keep uh, finding myself warming to Taprit. Uh, on the breeding side, obviously, he's got a sire in his corner who's uh, who sired two of the last three Belmont winners. That's kind of a nice thing. I also think that um, in the last two races, 
poor breaks have made him look like maybe more of a closer than he is. And that he might have just the right grinding style to get that trip mat that you were describing where not going to necessarily be on the engine, but going to be in the top half of the field and just going to be continuing, going to be in a good position turning for home and continuing to grind as other rivals might get tired. Jonathan, I don't think you've been the biggest Taprit fan, so feel free to uh, make the negative case. But is that um, does, does that case for Taprit seem appealing to you at all? No, it does, you know, and and, uh, and no, I haven't been a huge Taprit fan, although uh, <clears throat> he is on my Derby uh, fantasy team. You're still um, talking about that? You had to bring that. <laughs> we'll get that. We'll get there. I was gonna. I was gonna save that for last, but you may. You may have jumped the gun. No, he was. He was. I thought he was affected at the start last time. He ran. Uh, he ran pretty darn good in the Derby, uh, considering all of that. Um, I think he's definitely the type of horse you want in this situation. Uh, I think that the dam's average winning distance over foals is like seven point nine furlongs. I mean, that's that's pretty. Far, that's pretty far for an average winning distance. Um, and, you know, and, and Todd's obviously can, he's obviously shown that he can win this race and um, he can get a horse ready for this race. And so I, I would expect Tapper to run really well. What is your take on Tapper, Matt? Are you, uh, the, the other part of the case is the, the profile, uh, the, the, the run in the, the run in the Derby, even an off the board finish, but a, but a, a run with a pulse in the Derby, the five weeks time coming back. Do, do, do you see the case? Absolutely. He, I think he makes a lot of sense in here. Um, I, you know, I, I've gone back and forth with this horse, what I overall think of him, but I think a race like this is right up his alley. He just kind of gives off the impression that he just is going to kind of grind along. Um, um, my only concern at this point is I don't know how he's going to be bet. I, I have a sneaky feeling that of sort of the, the other horses outside of, I'm going to call them the big two, just because we know Classic Empire is going to get bet. And I think just simply because he's going to be a storyline Epicarus is going to get bet. I think Taprit may end up being kind of the wise guy horse. It's an interesting idea, and I totally get it. Old school handicappers, I think, are going to see a lot of the things we're seeing. One thing, though, that I'm not sure if we'll register for Taprit is uh, the computer money, which obviously, I mean, it's it's less of a percentage of the pools on a day like the Belmont with so many uh, uh, humans and handicappers betting. But still, I've I've just I gotta figure he's dirty enough that uh, computer oriented handicapper handicappers and wagers are not gonna come up with him. I'm hoping that's gonna create enough juice. Um, I was writing a little preview piece for DRF that's gonna be appearing. I don't I think it's in a special supplement section that I think will be out on Friday. And really difficult assignment I was given. You have to. Uh, assess the value of the horse and try to come up with a number from this far out. The number I came up with, with for Taprit to be like basically hanging a value line number on him was six to one um, too high or, or, or too low, Matt. I think it's probably pretty darn close for me. It's too low uh, just because I, I think there are going to be other horses that may be a little bit more. I don't, I don't want to say interesting, but other horses that I'm going to be more interested in betting at that price than Taprit. I hear that. How about you, six to one, Taprit? J.K., where does that sit with you? Um, answer this question first. Where do you think Irish War Cry will be? Oof, that's a. He is so tough to come up with. He's another one that could attract, I think, a lot of money. He fits that profile. Um, obviously, was so bet was bet so much more than Taprit in the Derby. You got to figure he's lower, don't you? Yeah, I would think so. And if he is lower, then I would want Tapper. To, I mean, and if he's lower, wouldn't Tapper have to drift to like eight? If because that would mean that Classic Empire, Precarious, and Irish Warcry would both be shorter, with Classic Empire being four to five. I feel like Tapper has to be eight to one. I said that with so much confidence, like I'm really good at math, but I really have no idea if that's right or not. <laughs> we do have to take a look. It is having such a full field, and it's uh, it's swelled to 13 probable starters at the moment. There's a lot that goes involved. I'll tell you what, we can put a pin in this. We can come back to it a little bit in a couple of days' time when we at least have uh, a morning line to help us and we can actually put a spreadsheet together and do the math. I know that's an exercise math that you do from time to time. Have you taken a preliminary shot at making a spreadsheet with a Belmont morning line yet, or do you save that for closer to the race? I usually wait until the, the PPs themselves come out. Uh, maybe the exception is the Derby, just because we know 100% what that field is going to be, you know, basically two or three weeks in advance. Um, 
The interesting thing I'll say right now, and, and I was talking to Ilman about it before I left the office last night, I, I think more and more, you know, you look at it, and I'm just thinking from a, not necessarily the international contingent because they've got their own pool, the Japanese pool. The NBC, with no Derby winner and no Preakness winner, you have Classic Empire, but then they need some sort of story to pump. And you better believe it's going to be Epicarus. I have a, I have a sneaky feeling this horse is going to get absolutely buried at the window. And I'm not going to say he's going to vie for favoritism, but I don't think he's going to be that far off. I won't be surprised if he's five to two. Very interesting. I would totally agree with that if the pools were being commingled. Japanese uh, market, we've seen it happen when the Japanese runners come and run in the arc. Um, how how much Japanese money will go on there? They they love to bet their horses, and and we've seen that create some crazy tilting effects in the past. But from what I understand, and it sounded like you had heard the same thing, the Japanese money is going to be separate, right, Matt? As far as I know, they are going to be betting in their own pool. I was just thinking, you know, here in the states, we saw, you know, Thunder Snow took a couple of nibbles. I want to say he was in the fifteen to one range before he went, you know, bucking Bronco on everyone. Um, but I, I kind of feel like, you know, if you remember back to the UAE Derby, and I know we're talking about different horses in a different, you know, situation, but Epicarus was right there as the co-favorite with Thunder Snow in that eight, nine to five range. Um, I don't, you know, I, I don't know. I, I have a hard time. More and more I, I think about it and you hear everyone talk about, oh, well, you know, the, the, they know, they knew the, the public knew or, or the, the, the wise guys knew or whatever you want to call them. I mean, at the end of the day, aren't we talking about ourselves? The majority of the money bet is by people that pay attention to this thing day in and day out. So, okay, you're going to get your mom and pop that bet two, five dollars, whatever it is, you know, win place on these horses. But the, the significant money, I'd like to think, is coming from people like us that listen to this show or that play day in and day out. And I think just based on that alone, most people are going to look at this field and go, there's not a lot in here. Uh, Epicars is the fresh face, and he's been pointing for this all along. It is an interesting point. I mean, they, from a v very early on, the the bonus that he was eligible for make made them think about this race. That's got to mean something. But I mean, in terms of how short Epicarus is going to be, what do we really know about how good this horse is? Doesn't uh, doesn't that uh, uh, doesn't that factor in? Um, uh, to, to wanting a little bit more juice in the price. JK, help us out here. How do we talk about Epicarus uh, and, and your case for him and uh, and maybe give some sort of guess at what kind of price you'd like? Yeah, no, I agree. I think he's going to be bet, especially with nothing else in there. Um, the, the idea is that for me, it was, you know, it's the same reason. It's the reason I like Thunder Snow. I, I thought that race was actually productive in the UAE Derby. I thought that, I thought that they went really fast and um, two good horses kind of battled it under the wire, and Thunder Snow has come back and 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 run on the grass, but shown that he's actually a, a talented horse and a good horse. And so that's kind of my angle here. And I think the horse is live. I I, I think probably five to two, three to one is where he'll end up landing, and and I'm fine with that because I think he'll be longer than than that in multis, considering that every ticket will have Classic Empire on it. So if you can beat Classic Empire in a multi situation, I think you'll find your value there. For for those who who don't know what J.K. is talking about or missed the show when we talked about it here, uh, Thunder Snow, excellent second, I thought, to Churchill, who was very impressive winner in the Irish Guineas, sort of validating the form of that uh, UAE Derby. Did you get a chance to see that race, Matt? I did, yeah. I, I thought he was very good. I thought both of them were very good. Churchill, particularly, he looks like he could be something. But Thunder Snow, I mean, he ran very, very well. And keep in mind, this is a, a proven group winner as a two-year-old over there. And we saw before he, you know, threw a fit in the Derby that he, he's he's a very talented horse. And, you know, the UA Derby, I'll admit, maybe I was the first one, or maybe I got off a little bit prematurely after, you know, I saw Master Plan come over here and run as poorly as he did in the Peter Pan. But keep in mind, that was, you know, there was a deluge in the middle of the race. And, you know, I, Lancaster Bomber, he's basically just kind of been a pace setter. So I was a little bit unsure what to make of the race. But you go back and you think about it. Before the race, I thought it was good. Coming out of it, I said, oh, I don't know. And it had nothing to do with Thunder Snow throwing a fit in Kentucky. But um, I, I think, you know, you've got to acknowledge that Epicarus is a nice horse. He looks the part. He looks like this is something that he wants. Um, I agree with Jonathan 100%. I think if this is the kind of horse that you're interested in, um, maybe five to two isn't great as far as proper win odds are concerned, but boy, from, from a multi-race standpoint, that's where you're going to get your value. 
Yeah, that's if those prices are correct, it's going to definitely send me to uh, it's going to definitely send me a little bit more than I was originally thinking to the Taprits and Irish war cries of the world. If those two are going to be both buried to that degree, going to be really interesting to follow along. Before we leave the conversation, a couple more horses I do want to pick your guys' brains about. We talked about Irish war cry, a little bit the opposite of the Epicarus situation where you had a horse been pointing for this for so long, this being a situation where uh, relatively recently, just over a week ago, I guess, it was sort of officially decided he was going to be pointing here. Jonathan brought up last week that that was not something, you know, you always prefer to see the the trainer circle the race several weeks out as opposed to a couple of weeks out. Matt, does that have any bearing on your uh, assessment of Irish war cry coming into the Belmont? Um, I, I mean, it, 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 it's something to keep in the back of your mind. Um, but at the same time, I guess, you know, how much how much time could he really have? There was only three weeks between the two races. And, he, and I'm looking at it saying, and I know he ran, he didn't run in the Preakness, but I, I, he's got to be doing well if they're going to go on with, with a spot like this. And for me, he is sort of, he's the horse that I'm going to have to make a decision on. Because if I thought he was good enough to beat 19 other horses five weeks ago, this is a much lesser group. The distance, I don't think, is going to be much of a problem. And he, he may be the one cutting out the fractions. Um, the question becomes, what the heck happened in Kentucky? What the heck happened two starts back, or three starts back, rather, when, I mean, in the Derby, if you had in-race wagering, I, I would have probably dumped everything that I had with three-eighths of a mile to go because Rajiv Mirage is looking under his shoulder, and then this horse stopped like he was hitting the head. I don't, I don't know what to do with him. If he runs his best race, he he's just better than most of these horses, if not all of them. I just don't know just if we're don't. gonna get his best race. Yeah, well, it it you're gonna have to be compensated, I think, in terms of the price that you get. But he's not a horse that I'd overlook, especially if you're looking at a dry, if you're looking at sort of your regular fast track. I mean, that is a common denominator between the two poor races, as uh Graham Motion pointed out. Um, in the pages of the Daily Racing Forum and on DRF.com that you had the the drying out, quote-unquote, cuppy track uh, that led to the first bas bad effort and then, of course, the slop at Churchill. I don't really fully get the slop as an excuse given how I was, uh, given how visually impressive he looked. And I agree with you, Matt, with in-running betting, uh, you double whatever you had on him turning for home. But still, maybe it caught up with him as the race went on. Maybe it was a case of on that track, even being three and four wide like he was early, that was wide enough to just um, take the starch out of him. Uh, and we've seen, as those horses continue to run back, how advantageous it seemed to be, at least in the derby itself, to be on the inside. Those things are all enough for me to very much leave him in the mix. Where are you, JK, overall with Irish Warcraft from this far out? Yeah, I think it's going to be a draw to situation, right? If he draws a comfy kind of outside situation. I'll feel better about him drawing an inside situation. Right. However, you know, you know, to kind of what Matt said about Rajiv looking through his legs and under his shoulder like he was Johnny V on Uncle Mo. Um, um, <laughs> I I heard Rajiv in an interview where he said like at the three eights like he said like in his mind he thought I'm gonna win the Derby. I just need to know by how much. And the horse <laughs> was just empty. I, I mean I think he thought he was loaded. Um, so that gives me gives me a, a, a little bit of a better feeling, considering that he was on the slop on the outside of a, of what has obviously been it was been proven to be an inside track. So I'll give him I'll another give shot here, but it just depends on where he draws and and what kind of money he's taking. But I could see him using being used as a as a possibly even an A horse uh, in uh, my you know DRF ticket maker situations. The point about the draw, obviously, very important. And, and Jonathan, you've had some really good examples recently on the show of designing races in your head. There's really no way to do that until you have a draw. Am I correct in saying that? Yeah, no, absolutely. And, and you know, my initial thought is I want Irish war cry in the, in the clear. However, <clears throat> I also wouldn't be upset if he drew the inside and was forced to send and go to the front, because I think that that would be his best shot of winning uh, the 12 furlong. Uh, Belmont Stakes would be on the front end. So, um, you know, it just depends. It just depends where, where he draws and where everyone else draws. But, you know, I usually reserve the A and B decisions for uh, to see the post positions. Certainly, training at Fair Hill under the care of Graham Motion. These are things that make me feel confident about him being able to get the 12 furlongs. So it'll be an interesting course to talk about. 
a horse, Matt, that I know you've been higher on, uh, I think, than either of us for, for quite a while. I'm curious how you reacted to the news that your friend Gormley's going to be participating in the Belmont Stakes. He's another one who, just looking at the paper, will, certainly will have that angle of Derby uh, five weeks pointing for this race. How seriously do you take him? Well, he'll be the most aggravating result because I don't plan on having him anywhere, so he'll end up winning. But um, I, I just... <laughs> I, it's hard for me to look at right now. He's just going he, each one of his most, I think three or four most recent races. He's just, he's regressing. He's not improving. And I understand maybe you've got the Derby, you know, built in excuse, but I still don't like the Santa Anita Derby, no matter how well paddle of midway ran in the, in the Kentucky Derby. It just, I, I don't know. I still like this horse. I maintain eventually he's going to be a turf horse. I'll, I'll probably go to my grave saying that, but um, I, I think he's, I think he's a nice horse. I just, I don't think I want him in this spot. Yeah, I, I, I feel you as far as that goes. I'll, this last conversation, I'll ask the both of you, and then we'll turn uh, to a, to other issues and give you the opportunity, Matt, to, to take off if you got other stuff you got to do today and want to go back to your usual Tuesday role as uh, as listener as opposed to participant. But, the, but before uh, I even give you the option of going, we've talked about, I don't know, roughly half the field in this conversation about the Belmont Stakes. Who's a horse? who you feel like mentioning, somebody who you feel like has a chance either to win the whole thing or to be useful in the verticals. Jonathan, we'll start with you. Who, who's another horse that deserves mentioning for this year's Belmont Stakes? I think meantime is one that I would take a look at using in certain spots. I don't know that he's entirely fast enough, but you know, sometimes when they when you stretch them out the distances like this to the mile and a half, they'll run, they'll run their best race or they'll run faster than they than um, than you would expect them to. And I think meantime is one that'll be a huge price. Uh, it looks uh, like Mike Smith is, is going to be there. So that's always easy for me to, for me to, to uh, latch on to, but that, that'd be one that I would take a look at. He's forwardly placed. He'll be involved in the race. Mike will obviously put him in the race. Um, he ran second in the Peter Pan. And I, I think that's something that, that uh, can go a long way. I, I would expect meantime to be involved and, and super affect the place. How about you, Matt? Anybody else uh, who you think warrants a mention at this early stage? It, it's meantime. Uh, I'm not going to go as far as to say I, I'm not ruling it out, but I, I, I'm at least considering picking him just because I think he's he's going to be forwardly placed, if not on the lead. If it's not him, it's Irish War Cry, even with the draw. I, you know, I mean, I, there's not a heck of a lot of gas in this race. Classic Empire will be forward as well. Um, you know, I thought he ran just fine in the Peter Pan and. Keep in mind, Jose Ortiz got a little got a little cute trying to float timeline way out off the rail, and all of a sudden there's you know a canyon's worth of distance between he and the inside, and Javier shot up the wood. Um, I don't think it would have made a difference one way or the other, but guess what? Timeline's not in this race. Um, I, I, I think meantime is very very intriguing. All right, couple of a uh, couple of interesting votes for meantime. Look forward to diving into this race. You can find all the tools you need at drf.com. Going to have a couple of handicapping sessions later this week, Wednesday and Thursday nights. That's going to be fun. Matt, you're going to have a ton of coverage as well. Where can people find uh, you via DRF Live, DRF TV for the remainder of the week and through the weekend? Friday and Saturday, we're actually going to be out at Belmont. We're going to be doing little periscope hits uh, either before or after races, doing recaps, and maybe quick previews and some picks and X, Y, and Z, just kind of assessing the tote. Uh, I'll tape my show Thursday. It'll air Friday, I believe, at the normal time at noon on live.drf.com. And then we'll have all the stakes previews and all that kind of good stuff, obviously, starting, starting tomorrow because you've got good graded stakes on Thursday, Friday, and Saturday. Excellent. Excellent. All right, Matt, we'll let you go. Thank you so much for coming and uh, bailing us out once again. I'm confident that Jonathan's internet connection will hold for the rest of the hour. If not, I have enough in my notes here. I could just filibuster and get through it. But we appreciate once again you being uh, Johnny on the spot. And uh, I think we're probably grateful that you never confirmed nor denied whether or not you were wearing pants for this hit. I, I have I have pants on. I can confirm that. That is that is that is fact. So uh, enjoy the rest of the afternoon, boys. We'll uh, chat soon. Cheers, Matt. Oh, good stuff. Good stuff. All right. Uh, you really I keep talking about how I owe Matt bottles of uh, Jack Daniels and Coke for his helping out in these shows. But but really, JK, shouldn't it be you who's providing them? Yeah, no, I always provide. I, I, I'm always providing Matt with drinks. I'm, uh, I'm peer pressuring him at, at any time we're we're together to uh, get another uh, Jack and Jack and Diet. <laughs>
So. <laughs> oh, he's a diet guy. I didn't. Uh, I, I, didn't I think so. I uh, thought he was. Maybe. I, well, I'm sure. I, I pre- I'm pretty sure he is. But I like diet better than regular Coke anyway. So. Hopefully we'll get a chance to to hang out with him soon. We can confirm. Uh, I've got a chance to hang with him the last couple of years at the end of June out at Santa Anita um, closing weekend. This year, I'm not going to be able to do that because just this morning, JK, I booked my trip. I didn't do the crazy month over there I was talking to you about the other day. I decided that wouldn't be good for my health. But I did book a two-week trip starting with uh, Royal Ascot. I'll be there hopefully covering what's going on on DRF Live from a handicapping point of view, providing quotes hopefully for the our crack team of reporters, uh, Marcus Hirsch and Steve Anderson, who will be writing the real stories. Hopefully I'll get a chance to get that teed up. If nothing else, though, uh, I'll take this vacation and just hang out at, at ask it for five days. I'm looking forward to it, man. No, that's going to be fun. I just want to know if you're going to have on a top hat. No, I'm not going to do that. It's too crazy if you're working and also like suits, I can wear a suit and I can bring over three suits and, you know, sort of recycle them and get through the five days. You know, if I'm spending the money on the, on the, on the crazy suit, like by, by day five, like nobody's going to want to sit next to me in the press box and I ain't renting too. So that idea is just out the window. So uh, Bernier confirms, in fact, diet, Jack and diet. So we'll have to, we'll have to remember that. Anyway, that's going to be a lot of fun. Before we get to that, another super fun thing I want to underline. Um, I get a notification every time somebody buys a ticket and the tickets are starting to fly for beer and whiskey days at Belmont, co-sponsored by Revolution Brewing, Angels Envy Distilling, the DRF Players Podcast, and Naira itself. Going to have a great time out there on Friday night. Uh, have you figured out your travel plans? Are you definitely in for this thing? PTF, you know me. I don't know what flight I'm getting on to the day before I leave. So, uh, I ha- and I'm I'm getting you have closer to being on the a- calendar. It is, is it, it is on the calendar, 100. That's all. That's all I need to know. I think J.K. Once you commit to going, it's going to sell out in a heartbeat. So, folks, <laughs> you know the wise guy move is to buy your tickets now. You can go to Eventbrite.com, search for DRF podcast, search for beer and whiskey days, search for Belmont Park. All those things, I think it's going to come up. Uh, we got a nice note from a pod listener who's the last person to sign up just yesterday. It's going to be a great day out. You have options. You can meet us out at Belmont and join in the fun there. We're going to be in one of the, the really cool picnic areas that are available for groups to rent. You have grills. You're on the grass between the building and the track. It's going to be great. Or you can start with us here in Brooklyn. We're going to meet up at Barcade. Very cool bar. You would love this place, Jonathan. You might not want to leave. Barcade is the only problem because it's got like vintage 80s video games and really cool beer and spirits. I so, think I've been there. Is it is it like underground in the meatpacking district? There might be a second one in the city that is it, that is in or near meatpacking. But the original location, the one we're going to meet at for this day, is out in Williamsburg. So you can meet us there. Um, Anyway, we're going to have a lot of fun. The bus will take you to there, from there. Uh, you can take the bus one way if you want and take the train back, whatever suits you. Anyway, if you've got questions about this or any other questions, really, hit us up on Twitter. You can find me at Looms Boldly. He's at UT Big Hair. You can also ask us questions, um, podcast at drf.com. Those will come to me. And that's probably a pretty good segue, I think, Jonathan, to answering some of the questions that have come in during the past week. Um, The first one comes from Michael. He saw that I was uh, complaining about the state of the Mets, whether it was the mascot flipping off the fans or the 538 article that just confirmed what we already knew about all the injury trouble that the Mets have had making their pitching staff go from uh, the best to the worst. And he offered me a little olive branch and said, there's another team in New York up in the Bronx that I could root for instead who are having a pretty good year. Uh, all I'll say is uh, I don't I, I don't th- I appreciate the offer of becoming a Yankee fan. I don't think I can actually do it. Uh, I'm not like a, a, a crazy rah rah Yankee hater type, but uh, too many of my relatives at this point would be, even though some of them were Yankee fans back in the day, too many of them would be spinning if I uh, in their graves if I were to to cross over to what I still have to describe as the dark side. So I'll take a pass on that very nice offer and I'll stick with the orange and blue and just you'll have to accept that I'm going to be whining a a little bit. You're not a baseball fan at all, are you? 
Um, no, I'm typically a fan of things that are outside that serve adult beverages. So like that <laughs> part of it, I can get down with. Um, but it's just kind of long and boring. And that's what it was like 182 oh, games. And, ah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, I, I'll tell you, it's a lot more interesting if you bet on it. So that's my advice to you to, uh, increase no, you know your- what? I've, in, in my sick days, there's been times where I've bet on baseball, not very often. Um, maybe, you know, 10 times in my entire life. It's stressful as hell. You, you, you get up and it's like, it's stressful. You're down. You feel like you're never going to catch it. It's just, I, ugh, gross. <laughs> well, I, uh, all I know is that you and I, the last time we were in Vegas, bet an NBA parlay and, and somehow managed to get the one to seven uh, Cavs beat. Um, so, so maybe sports betting just is. That's actually a funny story. We should tell that story if you've never told it. Do it. No, I don't think so. Okay, okay, so we're all sitting in the. This is kind of the the NHC wise guy thing. We get out of the Treasure Island because there's a lot of hellos and oh, good to see you. How you been doing? How you you know that whole deal. So we usually find another sports book to go hang out at, watch Gulfstream's terrible Wednesday racing, um, and you know make little wagers here and there. Um, we bet uh, we bet always dreaming when always dreaming. We we bet like a bunch of pick fives like singling always dreaming. When he went up, the, the the famous day where Johnny V came up to 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 ride him and his when he met, when he broke his maiden at Tampa, and and I go to line to cash a ticket, and I'm behind this guy that I can't describe any better than looking like he was absolutely homeless. He looked awful, and he bet and I don't remember the number. It was something obnoxious. He bet like five thousand dollars on Long Beach Poly plus thirteen and a half on Thursday night that he bet it a day early. So I go back to our seats where it's like me, you, John Nichols, I think Eric Bialik, Philly Joe, I think Nick maybe was coming over, was heading over, just got there, uh, Duke Matisse, and we all were like, we got to bet this game. This guy obviously knows something. He, he has to know something. It's either that or he's sick and he sucked us into his trap. So me and Pete and put together like a five team parlay that has that game in it. And we use the Cavs minus 280 or minus 360 or something at home on the money line. We're just trying to juice it up a little bit. And we're shorter. Uh, than that. Right, right. Maybe it was. Maybe. And we're the only idiots that didn't hit it. And, uh, and, and Philly Joe, we're at city at dinner and he, he bet the, he bet the game straight and they won by 11. They, right. they was, were 13 point dogs and they won by 11. So. You know, he did. I don't know if he knew something. I'm, my presumption would be he was, you know, one of Billy Walter's runners or or, or something like that or, or, or an equivalent legendary figure in the gambling world. But the guy, your description was very good. I mean, he looked like Belichick on a bad day. I mean, it was it was uh, it was it was gnarly. So uh, it, but no, I mean, I, I bet you if you tried that 10 times, you would you would probably end up getting punched in the face plenty. But on that day at that book. It was uh, it was easy money. Q Billy Joel, um, and we had uh, and and you and I managed not to join in the fun. I think the point was, hey, if we lose our parlay, we're gonna come back and bet the game straight. And then you know you're out in Vegas, it's crazy. You're sitting at dinner, and uh, oh damn, we missed tip off, and we end up making nothing on it. But but some of our friends got paid, as I remember correctly, right? Yeah, I, yeah. and and I also yeah. just to let everyone know how sick I am, I faked go to the bathroom in the middle of dinner to try to go bet the second half and they wouldn't take it. <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic. Gets up from Carnivino to go. Uh, I, I thought you disappeared for a little too long that night. It all makes sense now. All right. So you, one of something you said in that spiel uh, relates directly to one of the questions we have. So we're going to start there. And this was somebody, um, you know, obviously in truth, it's great. Love meeting people love saying hi, all that stuff. It is a little intense in Vegas just because there's just, it's one of the only places where it's just everybody is a horse player during that event. And sometimes it can get a little intense, especially when you have things to do. But this question has more to do with big racing days when, and everyone listening to this has probably been in this position at some point. If your friends know that you are a racing person, a big day comes around you're going to hear it half a dozen times. Who do you like? Who do you like? Who do you like? And in some cases, I made a joke about this on Twitter this time. I had spent Derby week, no exaggeration, 
I, I think I, I wrote about uh, 2,000 words and broadcast for something like five hours all about the Derby. Uh, my friends, rather than, you know, supporting me and checking out some of my programming, no, no, no. Just get a text anyway. Who do you like? Who do you like? Who do you like? And so this question came in, JK. How do you deal with that? How do you deal with so many people asking you who you like at various levels of knowledge and expertise? Um, how do you handle it? Well, I think there's two there's two different ways to handle it, right? It depends on their on their appetite. If it's a if it's an actual horse player and, and and my horse as you know, my circle of horse player friends, we don't typically ask because you know, I don't like ask for Nick's like, Hey, give me your picks for Friday. You know, I, I unless I'm just, you know, I know I want to get, get involved, but I'm not going to really do the work. Um, but typically what I'll do is I'll go to my notes feature on my oh, phone my- on big days and I'll just type race one, you know, two with one, four, five, and then race two, three with one, four, five. And then, um, race three, I'll put like two, three with one, four, five, whatever. And then when people ask me, I just copy and paste it and send it, copy and paste it and send it, copy and paste it and send it. Um, so that's one way to do it. The other way to do it is when you're having, that's when you're sending them to someone who kind of knows what they're doing and they can kind of use that to build what they're trying to accomplish. The other tricky part is when you're dealing with someone who's got no clue what the hell they're doing. Um, what I would encourage people to do is if you're with them, just have them bet along with you. Let them have 10% of whatever it is you're doing the entire day. Um, and then you just give them a bill at the end. All right, we bet $385. You owe me $38, whatever it is. Um, or you just break them off at the end when you guys won. That's fun. Um, the other option is to, you know, what I'll do is I'll, I'll encourage people to do show parlays that are going to the racetrack that don't know what's going on. Um, I'll just say, look, start with your 100 bucks, bet this horse to show, bet that horse to show. And then just kind of do it as you go, and you just have to give them one horse, and it's pretty easy. They can stay involved. It's easy for them to bet it. Um, the, the question that you're referring to, there was also a follow-up to that question where um, the guys, uh, he, was, he, was, he was pretty annoyed because he felt like when he gives his friends who actually are handicappers good stuff that he should, like, get broke off for that, you know, they should kind of, you know, essentially tip him when he does well, because it annoys him that they're, you know, his hard work, they're not doing the work he's doing. And he's annoyed by having to share that. I told him that he'd probably That's need to get new friends. Yeah. <laughs> so you think it is appropriate in that situation for the friends to break him off? Um, I don't know. I, don't, I mean, like, just, no, no. I don't. Uh, no. no, you're my friend. You don't have to break me off. I'm sharing it with you because we're friends. Um, so you're I, saying I he should get friends who he likes enough that he's not going to care if they don't uh, tip him. A hundred percent. Or he just doesn't send anything. One right. of the two. But to, to, to yeah, send mean, it and then be annoyed about it, I think is, you know, I, I wouldn't. I, right. I right. Wouldn't you shouldn't it. do it. You shouldn't do it expecting it to be like a tout situation. I mean, I've had every manner of thing happen. I will say if you're the recipient of a tip that wins from somebody who you know, you solicit, I'm not talking about an unsolicited tipping situation. I've talked about that in the past on the show. How to me, that's like, it's kind of really bad racetrack etiquette, tipping without solicitation. Like it's a normal interaction for you. You meet somebody and you ask them who they like, and then they tell you, but we all have friends who do this. They just sort of come up to you and just start spewing stuff. And like, that's, that's a little weird. And you'd never have any obligation to somebody tipping who wasn't solicited, but there've been situations, you know, maybe I'll take, somebody new to the track, okay? And we're sitting at a table and I'll give them a few winners throughout the day. I, in that situation, would be a little annoyed if they didn't pick up the check at the end of the day. Is that fair? A hundred percent. Yeah, yeah, a hundred percent. And I also, I don't think there's an expectation. Um, There's no expectation by any means because, you know, I don't, if someone has a score on a day, I think that score might be getting them out on life. So I don't expect them to, you know, whatever, but I think there's some sense of an expectation. If you have a good day, you should, you should probably lean your neck out a little bit further on the, on the check, you know, Hey, you guys just tip, I'll take the check, you know, something like that. You don't have to, you don't have to fully sponsor the group, but um, at least the way I operate is I think that good fortune will come back to you if you share it. That's why I'm um, some have described me when it comes to winning as being like kind of an obnoxious tipper, not like obnoxious, but just like, you know, just a, a lot looser than than people might think that I should be. But I, I just we'll think get to, 
We have a whole other question about tipping, actually, but we'll get to that in a minute. I did have a situation last summer where, like, total friend of a friend situation asked me for my thoughts on the day. I sent him along the lines of what you described, JK, just sort of like, okay, in this race, I like, you know, one with two, three. In this race, I like the four. In this race, you can get out using the seven and the nine or whatever. Happened to have a great day. And the guy was so genuinely grateful. He, like, just came up to me and, you know, he stuffed a little something in my pocket I let it happen. I didn't say no. Like, I would never have asked him for a tip. I didn't want or expect a tip. But I don't know, like, the vibe in the moment, I, I, I just let it go down like that. Was that. Is that okay? Are you okay to accept um, something like that? You know what? I do, do. I like that. You know what I like to do, too? And I know you like this, too, is that this is a really good way to handle those situations. If someone wants to give you 100 for something uh, because you did, you know, you did them a solid, you did them a favor, I always tell them, I say, let's bet it. And then, yes. we'll, and then if we win, we'll split it. So, That's you know, cool. let's, let's bet, let's bet it. Let's you know, you like the, you like something on the next. Oh, okay. I like that too. Let's box those two horses and let's bet it. And if we win, then, then, then we'll, then you can give it to me. Yeah. That's a nice then we'll idea. split it. Yeah. Yeah. I, li I like that. Now let's move on to the, the straight topic of tipping. We had a question about uh, when do you tip a teller? Um, and, and I thought your answer was great. And I think you can probably extend it. A lot of us, we go to this track, we sit at the same areas. We become, you know, the wait staff become part of the crew, certainly at a place like the Logan suite. So how do you, how do you approach tipping with tellers and then extend that to, uh, many of the fine uh, service people that we get to deal with on a regular basis? So when it comes to tellers, my favorite way to do it is if I go to bed a pick five and I have a horse singled, um, I will bet that horse to win for the teller. Um, and that will be kind of their pre-tip. That's the kind of the good karma tip. If I'm playing a combination where if I'm playing an A B pick five and my my all A combination at its at its lowest point is twelve bucks or whatever, then I'll buy them a a, a a matching all A pick five to kind of go along with me. I'd like to get people involved early because I think it's just good karma and you can get them rolling with you and cheering you along and it's fun for everyone. If for whatever reason I can't or I don't do that, you know, maybe it's a, you know, all the cash I have, I'm playing it on one situation or, or whatever it is. Then what I'll do, the other the way other that I'll do when I cash is I will tip, I just round, you know, if my payout is $252, I'll say, you know, 240 is fine. Or if my payout is 12,000, you know, 350, I'll say 12,000 is fine or whatever. I mean, I don't typically, I mean, if I'm one 12,000, I wouldn't really have a problem if I've been working with someone the entire day and they've been great or whatever, but um, I just um, usually round to a number that makes sense that I just kind of feel comfortable about. Um, and that's just, to, you know, it, and it also depends on how good my day was. If I had a bad day, then I'm, I'm a less of a tipper, but if I have a good day, then I'm more of a tipper. So, um, I like to try to get them involved early though, so that they're aligned with me and they win when I win. That's, that's what I prefer to do, but it's always not, it's not always the easiest thing to do. So you're typically talking about a situation where you're using one teller all day, but I think probably for a lot of people listening, that's not what it is at all. You might buy from one teller on the second floor and cash with another teller on the third floor. Do you feel obligated to tip in that situation and how would it change the way that you tip? Well, I, it changes. I don't do that. Don't so, and the reason I don't do that is because I just like going to the same teller. I just think it's, it's fun throughout the day to go to the same teller. And, and uh, when they tell you congratulations and, and I always try to cash with who sold me the ticket. That's I will, cool. I will wait in line. The, 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 the line to the left will be open and I'll be four deep in a line waiting to cash with the person who sold me the ticket. I just, I, so. No, I, I think that makes sense. Now I've seen obviously the kind of ticket construction that you use that I, that I use a lot of times. It's requiring a lot more of the teller in terms of punching in different amounts, if it's a dutching situation, we're putting in a lot of different lines of bets. If we're using a, a ticket maker situation, how much does the difficulty of the punch of the bet? I mean, to, to use an example, I'll, I'll bring it up before you have the chance to this time. When you played the famous $200 straight pick three, like easiest bet in the world to punch, are you inclined to tip that teller any less than you are? Um, our man in the Logan suite when you when you're putting in 72 different combinations on a pick five. <laughs> well, well, <clears throat> the reason I it, that was the greatest bet I'd ever made, uh, and still is the greatest single bet I've ever made. So at the end of the day, I sprinted down there to try to find her to tip her. 
Um, because if she would, I mean, like I, I told the story before, like she was right, like, you were late. You almost didn't get it in. So you yeah, did she get was panicking. Her... Right, right. Right. She was panicking because it was a $300 bet and she thought I'd said something wrong and she hit the ticket. I looked back and they were, they were gone. So, I, I mean, it, it, I mean, it was seconds away from, from not being a, a really big score. So, <clears throat> you know, in that situation, you want to take care of those people because you want to share, you know, kind of the, the, uh, the excitement with them, but no, I, mostly what I like to do, like you said, is is you want to reward the, the the people that are helping you kind of do the impossible, which is you know I think we 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 played a pick four when we were at Santa Anita. The other, it was like maybe forty eight tickets, you know the way we played it, <clears throat> and you know I usually give them a heads up. Hey, look, hey, look, I'm about to do forty eight tickets, so I just want to give you a heads up. And, and they, I mean, they don't they they're usually fine with it. They're I mean that's, I think you know they're cool with just hitting the tickets, you know. So, um. But usually, I'll, you you can get that impression of who's not cool with it, and that's the person I won't deal with. I'll go to someone who is who is cool with it. Now, but uh, just to reiterate the basic thing, the tipping, you think it's important. There's creative ways of doing it. It's not like going to a restaurant. You're not going to give them you know, 5% of, of whatever. You, you're a little more loose with it. You sort of equate it to breakage on the back end. If it's somebody you know and like, you try to get them involved in the, in the beginning. Um, is there ever a situation where you won't tip? Um, is there a situation where I won't tip? Off, off or big, you know, obviously you're not going to hit off. I don't think you're going to tip off if you're cashing for $50, but I'm talking about if you've ever had like a, a 500 or more hit where you haven't given any. No, I don't believe so. No, I don't. I don't. You're just the checking. only way I could think that I would do it is if, like, um, I went to go buy a ticket and someone was, like, very mushy or, like, did something kind of, like, kind of racetrack inappropriate to tell her, and then I was trying to make a point. But that seems pretty ugly, and I don't think I would have I've done that, but you know, there's no telling. But I, but that's still, I mean, I don't think there's really a reason to not tip someone. Um, if you if had a bad more, experience, then don't go back to them to cash, you know, go to someone else to cash and take you're care of definitely more. You're definitely more generous than me. I mean, there's plenty of times where I would have cashed. I mean, I, I think any time I've ever cashed for four figures, say, I would have tipped. But I think there's plenty of times where there's a nice hit at the end of the day that sort of turns a loser into a winner where I didn't get any particular great service. I was mostly betting in a machine and I'm just going to the window to, to get my money. Like, I mean, that, that's actually a good question. If you've been betting in a machine and you're just cashing out, you know, 800 at the end of the day, is, it, is there an obligation in that situation? No, 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 no. If you don't hand me the money, then you don't. Well, you know what, though? Actually, I'll be honest. If I have a voucher for $817, I would tell the teller, you know, I would probably tell the teller 800 is fine. Yeah, that's because nice. I would hope that the seventeen dollars that I kind of generously Generous. gave to that person who's been working hard all day will come back to me tomorrow um, when I play the early pick five, or you know what I mean. I, I just, it's it's just like kind of a circle karma thing. I, I just I don't. Um, in this game, there's so much luck, luck that you that need, you, right? You right. can be prepared, you can be good, you can spend five hours handicapping, but at the end of the day, you got to have some racing luck. And so, you know, I'm not a, you know, I'm, I'm not superstitious. I'm a little stitious, but I feel like if you can, if you can, if you can do some things that will have some good karma kind of flowing in your direction, then, then, then why not do that? I like it. You're making me reevaluate. You're making me reevaluate the way I do things. I would always tip if I got extraordinary service from a teller, like those examples you were saying. But I've certainly had days where it was eight seventeen at the end of the day, and I, and I felt like I was lucky to escape with my life, and I, and I kept the seventeen. You're making me realize uh, that there there are probably a lot of hardworking people down there who uh, who who probably could use that seventeen as as well as I can. I am extremely generous tipping our uh, regular service. At least I think so. We can have we could have uh others on we could have some of our our waiters and waitresses on who might dispute that but i do i do try to be very good in that regard <laughs> um all right well that believe it or not those two we have a bunch of other questions but we're gonna have to put a pin in them because we got we got through uh we got through an hour here with the help of our friend matt bernier just a reminder we're gonna be back on thursday not our usual Friday 11. We're going to be back on Thursday. And I've got to move it back an hour because I didn't understand uh, Perrin's end-of-the-year preschool uh, play 
is on Thursday. It ends at 1130. So I can't do 11. But if we push back to 12 Eastern for Thursday, that'll work. Is that cool with you, JK? It's all good with me. Will you be back on Planet Texas by then? That will be at Planet Texas, ready to rock and roll. I don't know what you did. You fixed your situation beautifully, though, between uh, the well, first was, minute and the twelfth minute of the show. Yeah, we started on Wi-Fi, and and uh, my 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 brothers are here, so we've got a drone hooked up to the Wi-Fi. We got seventeen laptops, four <laughs> iPads, you know, it, you know, all kinds of stuff. So it, it, I think that was it was a little bit clogged. So I had to jump off of there, get back on the uh, LTE, and then stand on the porch. Whatever, well, well, whatever lengths you went to, they were worth. The show sounded good, uh, and I look forward. We'll get to some more of these questions on Thursday at noon. Um, it's going to be a lot of fun. I want to thank Jonathan Kitchen. I especially want to thank Matt Bernier, um, who we owe tremendously. I want to thank all of you for listening, especially those of you who sent in your questions either via at Looms Boldly or podcast at drf.com. Going to be back on Thursday with a full look at this stakes-laden card on Saturday at Belmont. Uh, I'm Peter Thomas Fornatal. May you win all your photos. <laughs>